Let's I hope you remember we have started the study of the book of Daniel. And again, we are going to come back to Daniel chapter 1 to make some lessons from Daniel chapter 1 that we did not make the first time we were looking at it. So come to Daniel chapter 1 and let me read for you once again the 21 verses. To the book of Daniel chapter 1. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with some of the articles of the house of God which he carried into the land of Shena to the house of his God. And he brought the articles into the treasure house of his God. Then the king instructed Espedes, the master of his eunuchs, to bring some of the children of Israel and some of the king's descendants and some of the nobles, young men in whom there was no blemish, but good-looking, gifted in all wisdom, possessing knowledge and quick to understand, who had ability to serve in the king's palace and whom they might teach the language and literature of the Chaldeans. And the king appointed for them a daily provision of the king's delicacies and of the wine which he drank, and three years of training for them, so that at the end of that time they might serve before the king. Now from among those of the sons of Judah were Daniel, Ananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, to them the chief of the eunuchs gave name. He gave Daniel the name Belshazzar, to Hananiah, Shadrach, to Mishael, Meshach, and to Azariah, Abednego. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with a portion of the king's delicacies, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore, he requested of the chief of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Now God had brought Daniel into favor and goodwill of the chief of the eunuchs. And the chief of the eunuchs said to Daniel, I fear my lord the king who has appointed your food and drink. For why should he see your faces looking worse than the young men who are your age? Then you would endanger my head before the king. So Daniel said to the steward, whom the chief of the eunuchs has set over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, please test your servants for ten days and let them give us vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then let our appearance be examined before you and the appearance of the young men who eat the portion of the king's delicacies and as you see fit, so deal with your servants. So he consented with them in this matter and tested them ten days. And at the end of ten days, their features appeared better and fatter in flesh than all the young men who ate the portion of the king's delicacies. Thus the steward took away their portion of delicacies and the wine that they were to drink, and gave them vegetables. As for these four young men, God gave them knowledge and skill in all literature and wisdom. And Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. Now at the end of the days, when the king had said that they should be brought in, the chief of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar. Then the king interviewed them, and among them all, none was found like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore they served before the king, and in all matters of wisdom and understanding about which the king examined them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and astrologers, 
were in all his realm. Thus Daniel continued until the first year of King Cyrus. Well, brothers and sisters, this 21 verses should be familiar to you since we have read it a couple of times already. And so, brothers and sisters, once again I call your attention to what you are learning here. Three lessons from this portion of Daniel chapter 1. You find here, brothers and sisters, the time in which Daniel lived. Throughout human history, you find wars and fighting. You know that China, as we understand it and know it today in modern days, <coughs> was not a China that was in history. It was actually divided into smaller kingdoms under many different kings. And how there was fighting almost every year. This part of China fighting the other part of China. And China being conquered most recently in a terrible way. Conquered and occupied by the Japanese Empire. And how many Chinese died as a result of war and fighting. You find in human history, nations invaded with violence and force and people taken away by force. You find land destroyed, buildings burned down, and people forcefully taken into captivity. At the same time, soldiers captured, soldiers imprisoned, soldiers tortured, soldiers also killed in many horrible ways in history. This was the time, the kind of time you find the prophet Daniel living, as you are told here, of the military advances of King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon. This was what had happened to Daniel himself. He was, as we are told here, brothers and sisters, taken away into exile, far away from his family, far away from his own country, across the desert into Babylon, which is today's northern part of Iran and Iraq. And there, brothers and sisters, he finds himself being stationed there with no prospect of going back to Judah or Israel as we understand it today. Yet, brothers and sisters, it is very interesting and also a very a sad episode in the life of Daniel. You find here the mention in verse 2 of the higher hand of God. Look at what you are told there in verse 2. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into the hand of the king of Babylon with some of the articles of the house or the temple of God. And how Nebuchadnezzar carried into the land of Shena to the house of his God, and he brought the articles into the treasure house of his God. You find there, brothers and sisters, in all this chaos and all this separation and misery, the hand of God. Isn't it amazing? You see, brothers and sisters, the Bible mentioned a man called Jehoiakim. Jehoiakim was one of the worst kings of Judah. Jehoiakim was the opposite of his godly father, a king by the name of Josiah. Josiah loved the Lord. Jehoiakim lived under the care of the father who loved the Lord, and yet he did not learn anything from the father. When he became king, when he grew up, he was one of the worst and the most wicked person that had ever been uh, in the kingdom of Judah. And so the time came when the Lord wanted to punish Jehoiakim and the kingdom in which he was the king. And the Lord used the Babylonian as his instrument, as the means to punish the people of Judah for their sins and for their evil. You see, brothers and sisters, it is God who gives each nation the kind of leader they deserve. Sometimes we don't understand. How can? How come? How come the people are so silly? 
They know that these people are not worthy to be leaders, not worthy to be president and prime minister. But why did they choose them? Well, it is because of a general blindness that God indeed bestowed upon the nation and the nation became blind in choosing their leaders and these people became the chosen leaders. It is true. Listen again. It is true that some of the leaders currently leading the nations and ruling the nations around the world, it is true they are the most silly people in the world. The Bible says so. And yet they became the nation's leaders because it is God who was using them, who is using them to punish the nation over which they are the leaders. Judah, under Jehoiakim, had become very wicked and had become very evil. And you find here that it is God who gave them the kind of king they deserve. An evil man to be their evil king. You are told, brothers and sisters, right here in verse 2, that Nebuchadnezzar confiscated the vessels from the temple of God and took them back with him. It says, The Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, verse 2, with some of the articles referring to the holy vessels made of gold and silver and how it was taken away and confiscated by Nebuchadnezzar. And it was brought back, as you are told there in verse 2, and when he brought it back to his uh, country, he put it into the treasure house of his court. The Babylonian, under Nebuchadnezzar, they had uh, the, the, the chief god known as Murdoch. Murdoch was the chief god that they worshipped as the number one gods in their um, numbers of gods that they worshipped. This act that Nebuchadnezzar was doing is this. It is meant to convey to the people of Judah and to everybody in this world, Look! The God of the Babylonian is better and stronger than the God of the Jews. Look! Our God has conquered your God. And to show that, look! I confiscate everything that used to belong to your God and now they belong to my God. And my God is evidently, in his own understanding and eyes, more powerful than your God because my God helped me to conquer your God and your country. That is what the world is seeing. When the world wins, the world thinks that they are right. But they fail to see, brothers and sisters, that the real reason why this sad episode came upon the people of Judah and the temple of God in Jerusalem was destroyed was because God was using them to punish His own people. This is called the secondary cause. The secondary cause is a way of saying God uses means to accomplish His divine purpose. The Lord has not lost His struggle against this God called Murdoch. Nobody in the world today worship Murdoch anymore. There is no temple to Murdoch anymore. And the Babylonian Empire is no longer in existence. But God is still in existence. God is still the God of the Bible today. And so, history proves one thing, that Nebuchadnezzar was wrong. Instead, the Lord allowed Nebuchadnezzar to be his servants and instrument. The same thing happened 2,000 years ago. The Jews thought that Jesus Christ had been killed. When Jesus died on the cross of Calvary, they laughed, they rejoiced, they went home and they rejoiced because they say that the troublemaker is no more. They failed to understand that three days later he rose again from the dead. And God had used the Romans and the Jews to put to death his son 
in order that the Son should become the Saviour of the world. Romans 8, 28 is very clearly the lesson that everybody must learn when they look at Daniel and whatever was happening in his lifetime. That God brings everything to pass for the good of His people, even the use of secondary cause. God uses means to accomplish His purpose in this world. And so do not think that when things are happening and you say, Ah, there is no God. Ah, the, the God of the Christians have lost. No, no, no. Look further on and you will learn that God is the God of the heavens and the earth. And I hope you remember this lesson well. Then again, brothers and sisters, look at this man called Daniel. You understand, brothers and sisters, that Daniel was taken away from his country and was transported away to Babylon. In other words, Daniel was a young person. He was mostly, mostly as the scholars would tell you, about 14 years old. Anyone here 14 years old? Then you'll be about the age of Daniel. Daniel was your age when Daniel was forcefully removed from his family and taken away to a people speaking a different language, eating different kind of food, in a country far away with no handphone, with no internet, with no possibility of seeing his parents anymore and brothers and sisters anymore. And that was Daniel. He was taken away far, far away, and yet, brothers and sisters, when you read the book of Daniel, you realize that 14 years old, taken away from everybody who was influencing him and precious to him, Daniel grew up to be loyal to God nonetheless. A lot of people think, oh, I don't care about God, what a religion, what God, a stupid thing, all this, uh, God allowed all this thing to happen to me, and because God allowed all this thing to happen to me, I'm not going to be a Christian anymore. Just because you fail in something, you give up your religion. Just because you are sick, just because you fail your exam, just because you cannot get what you want, you leave your religion. That was not Daniel. Daniel had every reason to question the existence of God. Daniel could have believed Nebuchadnezzar and said, Ya Lord, the God of the Babylonian, more powerful, you no, know, conquered my gods. So my God is no longer God. The God of the Babylonian is God. But he didn't think that way. In fact, even though he was far away, Daniel continued to believe in God. Look at what you are told there in verse 8. But Daniel, purpose in his heart. We are talking about 14, 13, 14 years old person. At such a young age, he was able to already purpose. The word that purpose means determined. It means decided. It means convinced. Daniel was a man of conviction, you see. He was convinced that he will obey God. You hardly, brothers and sisters, you hardly find such dedicated and devoted Christians today Let's not talk about a 13, 14 year old person. Even you find it hard to find a Christian who is 50, 60, 70, who is of this sort, who is not tempted by the promises of the devil, riches and wealth, who, uh, who is not tempted by all these things, but continue to remain loyal to the Lord. We find that the early Christians were like Daniel. They were men and women Boys and girls of conviction, determination. Turn with me to the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 5. And we are there told about this information about the early Christians. The Acts of the Apostles, chapter 5, reading from verse 12. Verse 12. And through the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were done among the people. 
And they were all with one accord. In other words, they were all united together in Solomon's porch. Yet none of the Christians, none of the rest, though no, sorry, none of the rest, none of the non-Christian people who were watching the Christian, that joined them. But the people esteemed them highly. You realize that? That people were watching the Christians. And people held the Christian highly in their regard. They dare not join them. But at the same time, they dare not mock them. Because the Christians were men and women of conviction and the Christians were living so well. Not because they were rich, they were not. Many of them were just so poor. But even though they were so poor, people admired them. Even though they were suffering and persecuted, people admire them. Why? Because of their love for Jesus. And believers, look at them, and believers were increasingly added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women, so that they brought the sick out into the streets and laid them on beds and coaches, that at least the shadow of Peter passing by might fall on some of them. Also, a multitude gathered from the surrounding cities to Jerusalem, bringing sick people and those who were tormented by unclean spirit, and they were all healed. The Christians were something. The Christians elevated the suffering and the misery of those people who came to them for help. They themselves were persecuted, they themselves were poor, but they were willing to share with those who came to them for help. A lot of us, we think this way. If God make me a millionaire, if this year I get a lot of bonus money, well, I may be generous to help that uncle, that auntie, that cousin, and give money to church to build, a, to build our church. If God will give me lots of money, in other words, brothers and sisters, you think you will only serve God if you have extra in your wallet. Whereas the Christians, they serve the Lord, they give the Lord. Remember that poor widow just had two mites remaining in her wallet and she took out the remaining two mites and threw it into the offering bags in the temple. And Jesus saw it. There were many others who were donating lots of money and yet the interest of the Lord Jesus Christ was for this poor widow who only threw two cents. You know two cents? You go to a hawker center, they put there at the front of their stall. We do not want five cents and one cents. We do not collect five cents. Even five cents, they also don't want. I'm not joking. I can show you a photograph of it. Because I go to that hawker center very frequently. And there, in the, one of the stores, <laughs> sad to tell you is, the, the husband and wife who manage who manage that store, they are Christians, they are very wonderful people. But they have this sign outside that say, we do not collect five cents. And so it's really, ah, but there you have it. Do not serve God because you have more than enough. Serve God even though you do not have. And then you will be like, for example, in the days of Elijah, remember? The widow, how she used the oil and the fly and it never finished. Because God remembers those who are generous to Him. You see, sometimes we think that the world must repent and turn away from rebelling against God. The world better repent. Oh, those wicked people better better repent. Oh, those people there, you better repent. When actually the Lord is calling you to repent. Because unless you return to God, unless you take God seriously, there will be no revival of true religion. 
The society will never be better because you selected and you elected and you voted for people who say they are going to do this and do that. No, politician is not your salvation. Politician is not your saviour. Politician is not going to solve your problem. It is God and unless God turns and smiles upon you, you are finished. Singapore is finished. There is no future for you if the frowning of God is upon you. And therefore, brothers and sisters, it is time for you to turn God, turn back to God and repent of your sin. Increasingly, brothers and sisters, you find that young people are having tattoos and smoking and it has increasingly become acceptable for people to use vulgar language. The F word is now on television and even you hear people cursing. People are lying to their parents, they tell lies, they don't want to tell the truth. You see husband and wife divorcing and divorce has become so common it is no longer a pain. Young men and young women are sleeping, one night stand and cohabiting. The sad thing is even their parents will not even stop them. I have heard with my own ears, a parent, a, a father and mother saying, Oh, my daughter, oh, my daughter went to the boyfriend's house to stay. I no longer come back and stay, we are staying with the boyfriends. And I say, huh? Staying with whom? The boyfriend. I say, you allow what to do? You are so old already. Even if I don't allow what to do? And that's the attitude today. And we are talking about Christian father, Christian mother. And they excuse themselves just like that. And they say that they are no longer responsible. I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that unless this spirit is removed and is turned back, there is no hope for the church today. Hardly, you see, do you find Christians who look like Daniel in our time. Hardly do you find a Daniel today in the world. Hardly do you hear of a Christian who purpose in his heart that he will not defile himself with the things of this world. And therefore, my beloved brothers and sisters, I ask you, are the things of God important to you? Are the things of God precious to you? The president of Turkey, as you know, Turkey is an Islamic republic. The president of Turkey is known to be a staunch Muslim. Other one is his name. The president of Turkey actually called up the Pope in Rome a few days ago. A Muslim calling up a Roman Catholic who is supposed to represent the Christians and told the Pope, we have to stand up against all the nonsense that is happening in Paris. All the mocking of what is holy and sacred to people. When all this time, the Pope has said nothing. It takes a Muslim to remind a so-called Christian, hey, they are mocking your Jesus. Eh? What is happening? Thinking non-Christians are bothered. The Christians are not even bold enough to speak out and care enough to speak out. People are worried they lose their job. People are worried about this and that. The things of God are no longer holy to them. You remember, as I read for you before last week, and I think that I want to you to come to know to the, the, all this, the existence of all these verses in the Holy Bible, because brothers and sisters, you ought to be reminded that the early Christians were people who were known to be with Jesus. Are you? In your behavior, in the way you live, in the choices you make, in the decision you make, anybody suspect you are a Christian or not? Can you turn to the Acts of the Apostles again? Chapter 4, 
and, and, and ponder on what is happening there in Acts chapter 4 and verse 13. And when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men, they marveled and they realized that they had been with Jesus. They had been with Jesus because they could see that they were influenced by Jesus. But are you influenced by Jesus? Are you influenced by the Bible? It is important, brothers and sisters, for you to make a stand. As I said before, Daniel was 14 years old or even 13 years old. He already knew what he must do as a Christian, as a believer of God. He was not going to allow anything, anybody to change him. He will live as a Christian. And as you go on to read about his story, it became illegal. Illegal for him to pray. And what happened? He opened his window. You know why he opened his window? He opened his window so that people can see that he was praying. Just like he had always been doing, he didn't change his life. It's illegal to the world. But to Daniel, he has to put God first. For you, huh? I wonder, brothers and sisters, for all of us, will we open the window? Maybe if it becomes illegal, we close the window and we pray. Because we say, safer. But Daniel opened his window. Did God protect him? No. Did he get into trouble? Yes. Was he arrested? Yes. And he didn't mind being arrested. He didn't mind getting into trouble because he loved the Lord. How about you? Many years ago, I happened to help somebody who was a student in Catholic Junior College. She had very recently became a Christian at that point in time. And a lot of people at that point in time in the late 1980s were reading books by Chick Publication, Albato and O. And because they heard that she was a Roman Catholic and that she was still attending a Roman Catholic Junior College, so they purposely gave it to her for her to read, to, to so-called booster her and fortify her from, from, from uh, all the influence. And she didn't know the danger that she was in. She took it with her when she went to attend lessons. And lo and behold, some of the classmates saw the magazines, the, 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 the magazine in her bags and they reported to the form teacher. When the form teacher came and asked her to open the bag and there it was one whole stack of chick publication public, uh, magazine on Alberto and the Roman Catholic Church. She was brought to the principal's office. She was expelled immediately. She called me in tears when I was still in the old church and said, Pastor, how? Pastor, please help. Pastor, how? I don't know how to go home and tell my mother and my father, you know, that I've been expelled because of this, what is happening. Pastor, help. And I have to call somebody to ask the person to see what the person can do to help this person. And he went to the school office to plead with the principal to give her a chance and to say that she's young, foolish, she didn't know the seriousness of all these things and she was innocent. It's not that she wants to influence other people. She was just reading it and she just brought along with her. And after the pleading, the principal relented and granted her a second chance. She gave me a bookmark to thank me for helping her. And the bookmark with the word says, Jesus is all the world to me. I do not know what I 
has happened to her since. But I want to impress upon you all, brothers and sisters, that if Jesus is real and that you really love Him, you'll be willing to stand up for Him. The reason why I'm sharing this message to you this morning is actually mainly because of the third point or the final point that I'm calling your attention to. The second and the third point is related. You realize, as I said so many times, and I do repeat myself because of emphasis, Daniel was just a young teenager when he was taken away into exile. Yet Daniel knew how to live in obedience to God even though his parents were not with him anymore. Neither were, were, were his relatives and, and his church people. Daniel was taken away to Babylon into a pagan non-Christian culture under God. He was not a free person, you know, he was an exile, you know. He was a prisoner taken away there, even though he was a young man. That's why he has no freedom to go and buy his own food. His food was even provided by the king. And yet, Daniel did not change, and Daniel did not turn away from God. He did not allow hardship and suffering to cause him to deny God. I want you to take note of this. If you read carefully, turning back to Daniel chapter 1, I want you to read carefully at verse 6. Daniel chapter 1 and verse 6 tells you this information. Look, uh, it says, And from among those of the sons of Judah were Daniel, Ananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Let me read for you again, uh. He said, and from among those of the sons of Judah, meaning to say, there were others who were brought together with Daniel and his friends, you know. But only Daniel and his friends remained close to one another as a group. There were others. But only Daniel and his friend refused to defile themselves. Whereas others, look at verse 10. I fear my Lord, the King, who has appointed your food and drink. For why should he see your faces looking worse than the young men who are your age? Meaning to say, Daniel, you may look very bad, but they didn't. Your friends, your, your other people, your, the other teenager from, from your country, those who are willing to eat, hey, they are better looking than you. How? In other words, brothers and sisters, what you are told here is this, that there were many people who were taken away together with Daniel and his friends, but only Daniel and his three friends remain true to God and it is because they remain true to God that they remain friends. Daniel did not find himself a friend to others. He was not close to others. They, maybe they were friendly towards one another but when it comes to problem, when it comes to the need to be consulted, he only go to these three friends people, he really considered them as friend, friend. And what kind of people did Daniel selected to be his friend, friends? People who are like-minded. People who together with him refuse to dishonor God. You realize that? Daniel did not choose people to be his friend based on his hobby. Hey, we all like to play football, so let's stay together. Oh, we like to play computer games, let's gang together. Oh, we all like to watch Korean movie, let's be friends together. Brother Daniel became friends with this group because, as it is proven again and again, because of religious reason. When Daniel realized that they were in danger of being slaughtered, who did he go and was sure 
that they will pray with him. These people. He went to these people. He called on these people. And they were together praying. Daniel had many others. But Daniel only associated and befriended those who were like-minded. And so turn to chapter 1 and verse 6. And what do you read? From among those of the sons of Judah were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Can you please turn to verse 12? Please test your servants for 10 days and let them give us vegetables to eat and water to drink. Meaning, the, your servants, that means not Daniel only, but Daniel and the three friends. Now, turn to chapter 2 and verse 17. There you find Daniel again. Then Daniel went to his house and made the decision known to the three friends again. Ananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, his companions. He considered them his companions. You know the word companions? Look carefully the word companions, the English word. The word companion means people you keep company regularly with. Your companions are those you, you are close with, but not just close. They, they are always in your company. You have so many people around you every day, brothers and sisters. But who do you keep regular and close company with? Who do you spend the most time with? You know somebody who is supposed to be a Christian, And her best friend, and the person that she has been traveling very regularly overseas with, is a lady who wears a tudong. And you go to a restaurant to eat, it must be a Muslim friendly restaurant. If you go on holiday, it must be to a destination where Muslims are comfortable. And she said that she's a, she's a Christian. But her best friend is somebody who's I just wonder how many of you are like Daniel. You have a spiritual taste, and your companion are those who will encourage you, who will support you, who will be close to you, and read the Bible and pray together with you. As you think about Daniel, I hope, brothers and sisters, with this sermon, to call your attention to see the hand of God in all these things. It is God who uses the Babylonian to conquer Judah because of the wicked king to punish him and the people. It is the same God who brought Daniel to Babylon to teach Daniel that he is real and true. It is the same God who has come to you in the name of Jesus Christ and ask you to trust Him as you journey on in this life. I hope, my beloved brothers and sisters, I have succeeded in this sermon to call you think about how you should be like Daniel. Let us pray.